Good afternoon. I'm Stuart Green, the CEO of Zoo Digital. Uh, we also have just uh, presented our uh, interim results. Um, in summary, uh, we've demonstrated a very strong performance across all aspects of the business. We have a very kind of robust and growing pipeline of work ahead of us, and we've been able to report some very healthy financials, including a 68% growth in revenues, all organic. So. Uh, I'd like to take, uh, just take a few minutes to really take you through the business and help you kind of understand the way in which we operate, the markets in which we're focused, and what differentiates Zoo from its competition. So we provide services to organizations that create feature films and TV series. In fact, the TV aspect of that, this industry is far larger in terms of number of, of properties than, than feature films. And what we do for these organizations is help them essentially maximize the return on their investment of creating those programs by allowing them to distribute them all around the world. And there are two main aspects of that. Firstly, in order that these programs can be enjoyed by consumers in different countries, the content needs to be localized. So that's to say it needs to be translated into the local languages of those countries. And in entertainment, that there are two different approaches that are taken for that. One is subtitling, where you have text that's overlaid on the screen. And the other is dubbing, where you use foreign language voices to replace the original voices of the screen actors. So one key aspect of our work is to do with localization, so take it into those local languages. And the other aspect is doing the technical work that's necessary to prepare the packages of delivery that are then supplied to the various different digital distributors, and that, which have now become the many routes to market. So five or 10 years ago, the home entertainment market was principally about DVD video. So if you had a, a properties of these sorts and you, want to, and you want to sell them to consumers to, to watch in their homes, then you'd go out and manufacture a DVD video disc and you'd sell it through retail or you'd rent it through, um, uh, through rental stores. So moving on to today, that landscape has been completely transformed by this revolution that's happened within this industry, brought about and enabled through the availability of broadband internet around the world, which in turn has led to the availability of a whole range of different digital services that are now available for consumers to watch this kind of content. Some of them are uh, in the category of what's known as streaming video on demand services, where you pay a monthly subscription fee as a, as a, as a consumer and you get to watch anything that's in that catalog um, in your country. Um, another method, the, the other popular method is called transaction video on demand, where you pay ostensibly in a similar way that you would if you were buying a DVD disc. You, know, you pay a fee and that, that essentially gives you conceptually the ownership in that copy of that, of that movie or TV series that you can then watch um, in perpetuity. So Zoo provides these services so that big content owners can take their properties, make them available to consumers all around the world. And the way in which we do that, and the thing that differentiates us in this market, is that we do all that we do through the use of these proprietary software platforms, these cloud-based systems that we have invested in over a period of 10 plus years that enable us to provide a far superior service. In a nutshell, what our software does is helps us to be very efficient in the work that we do. And in, in, as a consequence of that, we can offer very significant benefits to our clients. We can turn their projects around more quickly than they used to. We can offer them at very competitive prices and we can maintain a very high quality rate in, in the work that we do. The other aspect of the scalability in its organization, because the, the so, these software platforms enable us to scale enormously our throughput. But the, another aspect of the scalability comes from the fact that we use a network of freelancers who are located all around the world. And these are people that we engage to do some of the specific work on the uh, individual localized content. So until recently, 
the majority of these freelancers have been translators. They're freelance translators, they, re they work you know, from home um, around the world. We have about 3,000 of them in our network. And moving forward, we will have other categories of freelancers that we are, that we'll begin to work with. And I'll cover that in um, a little more detail in a moment. The clients we work with are the biggest names in the entertainment industry. So we work with all of the major Hollywood studios, with the BBC, with a whole host of producers of TV content and, and feature films. We also are a supplier to some of the largest digital distributors of entertainment content around the world, streaming platforms and transaction video on demand platforms as well. Just give you a quick timeline for the business. Um, since Zoo has actually been on the AIM market for quite a long time, uh, we, the company was originally listed in 2001. For the first five years of its life, the business was involved in a completely different operation. It was under, under different leadership. The current business focus really began in 2006, and that was the year in which Helen and I um, took up our positions. So prior to that, I was the chief technical officer of Zoo, and, and prior to that, I had been a co-founder of a number of startup software businesses. I have a software background graduate in, in computer science, and in fact, a PhD in computer science. That's given me a, a very technological focus within the business um, in terms of the way in which we've developed it over the years. Helen's background, she was previously the group um, financial controller and became um, CFO um, in 2006 as well, having worked in the software industry in finance roles. For the first period uh, subsequent to 2006, when we set out our business plan to work in home entertainment, our focus was primarily in the area of DVD, since at that time that was the prevailing uh, route to market for content owners. And during that period, we developed a whole range of different technologies that enabled us to offer superior services to our customers to help them pr to prepare DVD products for, for release to the market. Our first cloud platforms we uh, developed in 2009. And um, the current business um, uh, growth is coming from primarily from these localization services that I described. And that began in around about 2012 with the development of some specific cloud platforms that enable us to offer uh, very scalable, very efficient services around localization of entertainment content. And we began offering um, a subtyping service initially in 2013. So for the last four to five years, we have been uh, a provider of subtitling services to entertainment companies around the world. And um, the dubbing aspect of localization is actually a very recent thing for us. So we've spent about the last year developing a software platform that helps us to do dubbing in a very scalable way that we'll describe in a bit more detail in a moment. And, um, and in fact, in September, the last month of the first half of our, of our year, was the first occasion when we actually delivered first projects to our clients for that kind of work. So very new for us and a very exciting area, as hopefully you'll see in a moment. Our strategy is to offer these services and to continue to develop and grow the business through, through these services to these content owners differentiated by the proprietary software that we have. So this software is the Zeus secret source. It's the thing that very clearly sets us apart from our competitors. Typically, our competitors who may offer similar services do so in a much more manual way. Um, to scale those competing businesses requires a significant uplift in number of internal staff who will be overseeing projects and doing various different activities that are needed in order to fulfill this kind of work. In contrast, in the zoo business, the software is the key to our scalability. We obviously still need more people as we, as we grow volumes, but at nothing like the numbers that our competitors um, would need and indeed um, do employ in the market. The cloud software systems that we have developed are fully scalable, and they are used by both our internal production staff as well as that network of currently 3,000 freelancers around the world, simply by working with a web browser. So typically, our translators will be working from home with a, a, a PC connected to the internet um, in, a, in a web browser. So they don't need any special purpose 
um, software or hardware. Everything that they need is provided by our cloud-based systems and is very easily accessible to them. What I'd like to do now is just take you through the way in which the traditional ecosystem for entertainment um, localization works. And then I'll be able to contrast that with the way in which Zoo works uh, and so that you can appreciate the benefits that come from the software that we've developed. So the first thing is that a content owner who's spent um, a lot of time and money producing a new uh, program, say a TV series, will then need to localize that content in, a, in many languages in order to release it um, around the world. So um, that work is in the industry is always outsourced. It's seen as being a very specialist area. We're talking about translation here, and of course the localization service provider industry is, is, is huge. But the work that we're doing in localization is very specific and niche. So whereas um, other leading localization type businesses would be translating written documents, the, what we're translating is dialogue. It's, and dialogue is very nuanced, it's idiomatic, it contains cultural references. It's not the kind of thing that, for example, machine translation is able to, to process. So consequently, the translation element of the work that we do is always done by human translators. So a content owner will need to commission um, certainly some subtitle language streams for their content and possibly some dub language streams as well. Usually in the industry today, those are pursued through different channels. So in other words, uh, one company will be engaged to provide um, subtitling. And for example, we have been doing that for the last four or five years, where there is a preference from the buyers to work with multilingual subtitling vendors. So that's to say there are actually lots of companies in the world that offer subtitling, but the vast majority of them will only offer those services into their local languages. So there are only a handful of companies like Zoo that can offer, that are essentially language agnostic, can offer these services into any language. So the dubbing work will go down one work stream and in the other work stream, uh, we'll, it will obviously produce dubbed um, audio for the content. And the way in which this work stream operates is that it requires currently, based on the way in which this industry is configured, to work with separate dubbing studios that are located in each country. The reason for that is that in order to do this work, obviously you need access to voice actors who can actually speak the words in that, in that language. And, and obviously they tend to be located in the specific country of the language they speak. So what that means is that if you're going to dub into nine language, languages, the buyer will probably have to either directly or indirectly work with nine different facilities in different countries in order to do the individual uh, language streams. So the upshot of all of this is that dubbing and subtitling is, is dealt with completely separately. So there is inevitably duplication of effort that happens in this environment. And, and then when it comes to the dubbing, that dubbing is actually split up across different um, service providers in, in territory. So if I just spend a minute just describing the actual traditional dubbing process, the way in which audio is recorded for dubbing. Um, so this will be a typical um, setup for the kind of companies that in dubbing we would compete with. So first of all, these are very kind of bricks and mortar operations. So this is a physical dubbing studio in territory, say in Paris, doing um, French, French dubbing. It will have, it will be fitted out at some considerable cost to have recording spaces which are acoustically treated rooms in which voice actors will go to record their lines. And those recording spaces are, will usually be adjacent to what's referred to as a control room. In that control room, uh, there will be a sound engineer who's operating a mixing desk, a digital audio workstation, and is doing all the technical things needed in order to capture the recording from this voice actor. Also in the control room, usually there will be a dubbing director. So the dubbing director is someone who is native in the target language and who is, acts as the arbiter for quality. So this person is judging the performance of the lines and assessing whether they are a good match to, the, to replace the original audio that's been recorded by, uh, obviously by the screen actor. So key characteristics of this then are the you know, very bricks and mortar operation, a physical space constrained and limited by the capacity that it has. So if there are three recording rooms, that clearly is a, 
places a finite limit on the amount of material that can be recorded in any period. It's quite labour intensive in terms of <coughs> specialist um, expertise um, embodied within the sound engineer and, and a dubbing director who typically will be present through, throughout all the recording sessions. So quite you know, a high head count to actually achieve this. So moving on then to, to our approach to this, this ecosystem. So the first thing is that what, what we have done in principle is taken certain aspects of that traditional workflow and virtualized it and implemented that in cloud software. So for example, think of that, that sound engineer. What that sound engineer is doing during the recording session is, is uh, locating the individual lines of, uh, that are, sp are spoken. So they have reference to a script. We'll be identifying the individual lines in the video, queuing those up, playing them for the voice actor to see, and then recording each line um, so that the voice actor can then um, deliver that line, it can be captured. The way the voice actor works is that they have a printed script usually. So the, this um, sound engineer plays the, the, the clip of video so they can hear the original actor saying the line. So they'll take a look at their script that tells them how they're going to say it in their own language. And then the sound engineer will basically cue this, this, uh, this section of the video up and record their first attempt at dubbing that line. So obviously, what this voice actor has got to do is trying to start speaking when the character's lips start moving and make sure that just as they finish speaking that line, those lips have stopped moving. And in between, there may be, so obviously there will be lip movements and uh, there will usually be some effort made to try and match the utterances in the target language which the, with the lip movements in the original language. So as you can imagine, it's quite a trial and error process. So the voice actor will take a, have a first go at it, it won't be right. So, uh, so through a process of iterations, of keep repeating the recording the same thing, eventually they'll get to a point where the dubbing director said, yeah, I'm happy with that now. Um, so now we can move on to the next line. So this process will then be repeated for every time. So in our system, we virtualized the job of that, that sound engineer, that guy who's dealing with the recording. So that role, the mixing desk, the digital audio workstation are all embodied within our cloud-based systems. So we don't need that function. In our, in our workflow. Within our cloud-based systems, there are a number of different components. One that specifically deals with subtitling, so to help with the actual workflow process, and a second that deals with dubbing. Our subtitling system we've had, as I mentioned, for the last four or five years. In the case of dubbing, this is a brand new component that we've developed. We've also introduced actually a new um, offering um, to provide and prepare scripts, so the as-recorded scripts that our clients will normally need um, for, uh, for their programs. And by doing the work in this box up front, for us, it means that our subsequent subtitling and dubbing work can be done more efficiently. So in our environment, all the information for subtitling and dubbing is shared and centralized. So that means we avoid duplicated effort and we're able to work very efficiently, uh, particularly when we are commissioned to produce both subtitles um, and dubs. So moving on then to what our environment looks like. So this is, this is an example of a, uh, you know, one of our first live recording sessions uh, for the first projects that we have now completed. So we were, we were commissioned by um, a major player in the entertainment industry to, to dub six TV series. Uh, the first four of those we completed and delivered in September. And the majority of the recordings were created with a setup like this. So this is a voice actor. Um, su a surprising number of voice actors will have their own home recording setup. And that's because this is what they do for a living and a lot of the work that they will be paid to do will be things like recording audio books, doing voiceover work um, and such things. So it's quite common to find these, these folks with a home recording setup where they have spent a few hundred dollars on uh, some sound treatment to remove echoes and so on from the environment, and $150 on a microphone. In that traditional world, the conventional wisdom has been that you've got to spend a lot of money on the equipment that you're using. So, so in a professional recording studio, the microphones usually would be, you know, be costing $3,000 or something of that order. So, so the, clearly this is a, a much more um, contained environment. Clearly in this setting, when the voice actor is working from their own recording space, um, there is no need for all that infrastructure that exists within the traditional world and therefore we can potentially optimize out completely the need to use any dedicated dubbing studios. But the way our software is written is such that 
if a client required us, us to use a particular recording space, then we would, uh, we, of course, we would be able to do that. So in this setting, there is no recording engineer. There's no complex um, uh, workstation. Uh, this voice actor will be using a PC. Again, it will all be, all this information will be streamed into a, a web browser window. They'll have a USB microphone uh, or similar plugged into their, uh, into their machine. And then the software itself will guide them through this process. And what they will see on screen when they do recordings is the, is the video that's played to them. And beneath that video, there'll be karaoke style words passing from right to left on the screen and a, a line that indicates the point at which those words need to be spoken. We will have prepared those words in advance and we will have adjusted and scaled the text so that words that need to be spoken quickly will be compressed. Those that need to be uh, spoken more slowly will be um, expanded. So that as they, at this, at this continuous pace, as they pass over this line, the, the voice actor understands how they should be actually delivering the lines. ¿Tienes? ¿Te ha llegado? ¿No puedes alcanzarlo? What that means is that this voice actor can de deliver these lines in far fewer takes than it would normally require in a conventional space, and usually to a much higher quality, because we can actually control exactly how those words are delivered during that time frame. So generally speaking, we can produce better quality. We can obviously produce it much more quickly. Um, we can capitalize on the, you know, the huge capacity that now exists to do this work. So it's no longer constrained by these physical spaces in territory. Um, these folks are working from home and therefore we have practically unlimited capacity to, to create these recordings. And the software is guiding the voice actor through this process, giving them feedback after each take that helps them to refine their delivery so that they can uh, produce a very good result. So let me spend a moment now just talking about the market. Um, as I said, this is a very kind of niche specialized area, but in fact, it's an area in which there is a very significant spend. What I have here is some analysis of market size that comes from an organization called the Media and Entertainment Services Alliance, which is an independent industry group that, uh, uh, that went through an exercise to size this market. Specifically, this is the market that we are serving. Their, the scope of their study actually was restricted to Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So what is not included on here is the, the market where there is expenditure in the Americas in, in, and in Asia, which in combination will also be very significant, uh, but we just don't have any measure of that at the moment. So for the moment, what we're saying is that in EMEA, there's a $2 billion annual spend that was in Canada 2016 on these services and that this segment, this market is growing at a pace of more than 10% per year. The reason for that rapid growth in a market, obviously, which has been active for, for decades, is due to the proliferation of content through digital distribution platforms. So because there are these big names who are delivering these services to consumers, and, they, um, and they're able to operate internationally, the barriers to entry in new countries are falling away. So as a, for a content owner, it's reaching territories that previously would, be, would have been inaccessible in the days of DVD is actually very easy. And consequently, that's giving rise to more content being localized and for that localization to happen into more languages. As you can see, in terms of how that market is segmented, the two big pieces that we're focused on are subtitling and dubbing. Um, even though the majority of localization is done via subtitling, you'll see that dubbing is a much bigger segment. And the reason for that is the costs of dubbing are substantially higher than subtitling. So to take a program and to subtitle it and to dub it, typically you would be spending at least 10 times the amount to create the dub. And as a result, uh, generally speaking, um, the studios have historically preferred to do subtitling whenever they can. So just a few words about um, uh, growth in the business. In the period up until 2016, as I mentioned, much of the work that we were doing was still at that time linked to DVD products. And of course, DVDs were, and still are, um, sold in a, on a very kind of seasonal cycle around Thanksgiving and Christmas being the, the peak buying periods. And so consequently, in our industry, preparation of those kinds of products inevitably has that same seasonality. So consequently, given that our year begins April, our first half in the past has always been quite a bit stronger than, than second. 
We reversed that trend in 2017, as you can see, saw a, a second half which had built on the first. And um, the reason for that is due to the very rapid growth of these localization services that we offer now um, that, that don't have that kind of seasonal characteristic. There's no real seasonality in the demand for this localized content that, that we see. For the half year that we've just completed, as you'll see, a very significant uplift in revenues achieved in that period. So in our interim results, we picked out a few key highlights to uh, illustrate the progress that we've made over this last six-month period. Firstly, as I mentioned, we launched this dubbing service for the first time. We've won some industry accolades. So there are uh, the two of the biggest trade shows into which our business falls. Uh, we were successful in winning awards um, in both cases for innovation. We've successfully completed the first dubbing projects for a global entertainment client. That client has been delighted with the results that we've produced, and they've confirmed that the quality of those results is indistinguishable from what they have been used to receiving when they commission the traditional dubbing studios to do this kind of work. As I mentioned, we also launched a cloud-powered uh, scripting service so that we now can offer services to our clients on their behalf to prepare scripts for recorded uh, programs, which is a kind of an ancillary service that we're now able to offer. Uh, we've had, for a long time, we've had um, uh, some client concentration just due to the kind of a legacy um, in the business and the fact that in the past so much of it has been DVD related and, um, and actually much of that business was uh, linked to a single client. So in the, this first half, uh, that client concentration has fallen to 28% compared with 47% in the equivalent prior year period. And our expectation is that that will fall uh, further going forward. We, we retain the software as our competitive advantage, and therefore it makes no sense for us to license this, these software systems to our competitors. But we do have a program to um, select and work with what we call our um, uh, affiliate partners. And for the moment, we have these partners in emerging markets, particularly um, Asia and the, the Middle East. What these affiliates do is use our software. We train them and we, we provide them with our software systems so that they can use those systems to serve their local clients in territory. They will pay us a bit of licensing income for that privilege, but importantly for us, they provide us with a feet on the ground, a presence in those countries, which can be very helpful to us as we go to recruit uh, more voice actors, more translators, and more doing directors. They also act for us as like an outsourced capability so that we can um, overflow work to them when the need arises. And then finally, in this, uh, this first half year, we've uh, made a new appointment to the board, a non-executive appointment. So the board now consists of five individuals, uh, three executives, two independents. Mickey uh, Cleaver joined the board. He was formerly the CFO of Sportech and with a, a background in the, in the media industry. Okay, so financial highlights. Um, so revenue up 63%, huge, as Stuart says, huge increase in revenue. That's all organic growth and that is all in the area of the localization that Stuart's described. And as you said, we're very, very early in the dubbing process. We've only just released our tool. So the bulk of that increase is through uh, the subtitling revenue that we've got. EBITDA up 34%. We've continued to increase. We've ex expanded our sales team. We've expanded our R&D resource because we can see such an opportunity to us that we want to make sure we capitalize upon that. So we wanted to accelerate the development. Earlier in the year, we did a fundraising, which really cleared up the balance sheet and gave us the working cap that we needed so that we could actually really tackle this market in the way that we wanted to. And through that, the uh, net debt, yes, we raised cash and we capitalised some loans that were on the balance sheet. We have a convertible loan note that part of that was capitalised and we also had a loan in from Stuart that was capitalised. The statement, that looks fairly busy. Um, so just a few highlights. You can see that huge increase in turnover. So just to tell you a couple of the things behind that, we have legacy business, some software licensing and some digital packaging work. There's around about $4 million. We're reporting dollars because almost all our revenue is in dollars. There's about $4 million in both years on that. And that we see has been relatively flat going forward. 
And the subtitling revenue, we did 7.4 million in the current year compared to 3.5 in the previous half year. And we did 1.7 million of dubbing in the first half as well. So you know, that is clearly huge uh, expansion in the turnover. We think our P&L is probably a little bit confusing how we're currently presenting it because until now, we've always included all of the staff costs within the operating expenses. And as we perform these services for clients that Stuart's described, then clearly a huge amount of those costs will be variable. So although we can do everything with a lot less staff than our competitors, we still have staff to do that. So actually the underlying operating expense, if I was to move it up above the line, then I would be showing a fairly consistent OPEX. I'm working on about seven and a half million OPEX a year to cover, and then the rest of it is within the cost of sales. The gross margin has reduced between the two years, but that is completely down to the sales mix because the legacy business is high margin, but we have the external cost of sales for dubbing and for, um, for the uh, subtitling. And we too get R&D tax credits and have been receiving repayments from them. Key highlight on the balance sheet really, um, clearly a much improved position compared to the year end in March following the fundraising. Trade receivables jumps out as being enormous, um, but that is purely down to the increase in trade. There's nothing in there that I'm concerned about. So that's just this snapshot as at the end of September and that's working its way through. And to point out that the borrowings, that is the convertible loan note. We've got 2.5 million sterling in a convertible loan note. Uh, it's owned by the major shareholders, the biggest being uh, Herald and Stewart. Um, and it's 7.5% coupon, 48p conversion price, and it will mature in 2020. Cash flow, we're generating cash, but we're not showing it because of that huge increase in debtors. Um, so again, nothing that we're concerned about. We have enough working cap to run the business. We have an invoice financing facility as well. So we've got cash um, at our disposal, but we've also got that facility to dip in and out of should we need it just to match the trades. So in summary, and just to give a, an outlook for the business, uh, the first thing I would say is that our second half has begun well. We have a strong pipeline in subtitling. That, that pipeline is growing on a monthly basis. Um, and we also have a fantastic opportunity ahead of us um, in dubbing. I have to say that at the moment, because we're at the early stages of this, we are being very measured about the rate at which we take on new work for dubbing in these early months. So for the remainder of this year, the, the amount of work that we will process will probably keep, uh, you know, contain at a level that we are absolutely certain we have the, the capacity to accommodate whilst we are simultaneously recruiting these voice actors and dubbing directors and others that we will need in due course in order to scale that business up. One of the very exciting things about this proposition for dubbing is that for the first time, we will be able to offer a truly multilingual dubbing solution. And that has never before existed in the industry. What that means is that we will become very attractive, a very convenient supplier of those services for buyers who won't have to go to the trouble of placing work with multiple different um, organizations. In addition to that, we will also be able to offer the <coughs> subtitling work for the same content. And in fact, the first titles that we've processed with, um, with Zoo Dubs, what the client required were nine dub languages for this content and 24 subtitle languages. So we were able to take that entire project and, uh, and process it in record time for the client who is now uh, uh, delighted uh, with the results. In these early days of dubbing, we are, as you might imagine, being super cautious in the work that we're doing. We, the very last thing we want to do is to overpromise and under deliver to our clients. So we are checking everything very thoroughly. Um, there are certain aspects of our process that we're doing manually now that in due course will be automated. So our expectation is that the net margins that we see from dubbing will improve quite considerably from where we are operating today as we move into future periods. The actual operational gearing in the business 
we would expect that to really start to become evident in our next year of trading through to uh, March 19. We're very prudent in our cost management and ensuring that that soars in line with our growth that we're seeing and with the working capital uh, that we have available to us. And um, finally, we're very confident in being able to meet the full year expectations in the market. Thank you. When the operational gearing kicks in, what sort of uh, margin levels do you think are achievable? Go ahead, Han. Um, so, uh, the margins that we make on after the direct internal costs on the on both subtitling and dubbing are around about thirty percent at that level, and then we so we're we're aiming in the very short term to be getting towards 15% EBITDA margin and some of the uh, director's options are based on that metric. Can you say something about winning with or your distribution, how you get more clients? Is it, is it contracted with studios or like you know, Netflix or whatever? So your route we, to market, I guess. Okay, so the, um, essentially the route to market for us is basically direct sales efforts into the key buyers in the studios. So, um, so the, for the big buyers, the big, for example, the Hollywood studios, they have departments whose job it is to essentially manage the, the outsourcing of this kind of work. Um, in many cases, they will have, uh, they'll go through a procurement process every three years or so, during, uh, at, at the end of which they will have selected three or four approved preferred vendors that they work with. And out of that framework agreement, which sets out um, a rate card, then subsequently work is placed with us through the, actually the operators within the, that studio division who are just putting that work out. So for us then, having secured um, a client and been selected as an approved or preferred vendor, um, it becomes an account management function for us to ensure that we receive a good proportion of that work. Presumably you can, given your software solution, you can become, you can undercut the competition. How much the business is done on quality and how much is done on pure price? So, so the first part of your question, yes, so we have generally, we have due to the scalability that the software gives, which of course we've had to invest in, then we do have uh, more flexibility on pricing. Um, on this, on the question of whether the purchase is based on quality or price, then um, the kind of organizations that we're primarily dealing with now, so big film studios and, and others and big digital distributors, um, what has been happening there has been there's a, the quality expectations in the market have risen. So going back a few years when content was distributed on DVD, um, in gen generally speaking, the quality of those subtitle streams, for example, was not done to a, a, a very excellent quality. And now, digital streaming services, such as the one you mentioned, um, are setting a requirement, setting the bar high in terms of quality. That's actually given rise to a, some uh, reversal in pricing in the market, in that the buyers now, if they are targeting those distribution platforms, they know that their content must reach higher standards. To reach those higher standards clearly requires more work than they may, may have been paying for previously. So actually prices have risen on average in order to serve those kinds of markets. So I would say that the, there is a quality standard that must be met and, and so the buyers are working with organisations who, who demonstrably can meet those, uh, those quality standards. And then if you look at your existing relationships on, on, the, on the framework solutions, or whatever you want to call it, how, how many of them are you on in terms of the majors and how many of them can you get yourself onto both in subtitling and dubbing? You know, with, is there, are, you, are you missing from any of the big ones at the moment? So we're doing work for, for example, to some degree or other for all of the major studios. At the moment, we are a preferred vendor for three of them. And that cycle for those three came up last year. So last year, we basically um, were selected by them. There are two of the others at uh, various stages of going through that similar process now. And we are in the frame for being considered um, for that. Um, in terms of other major buyers, so the so a number of the a small, modest number, th probably three or four of the streaming services and transaction video on demand services, 
uh, have their own programs for preferred vendors, and we are again um, um, amongst the, the few who are chosen to work with work with them on that kind of content. And in terms, of what we find is we, when we are first working with a customer, they tend to start quite small. They're quite cautious, and then it builds. So even though we are with the, these listed as approved vendors for these people, there's still a huge amount to go at. There's still a huge opportunity for growth. You asked about dubbing, and obviously we're at a much earlier stage there, and, and obviously are pacing ourselves for, uh, 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 at the moment anyway. But we've obviously sh demonstrated this and, and shown the results of this to all our clients, um, who are all very excited about it, seeing the benefits that it can bring to them, namely potentially the ability to do this at a, at a lower price, being able to do it much more quickly. So the turnaround time that we're able to achieve on these projects is much shorter than the, the, you know, the competing um, ecosystem. And we can maintain very high, high quality. So when you then combine that with what we can do if we're taking, taking care of all the dubbing and all the subtitling, that becomes quite a compelling proposition for, for our clients. The buyers for, for dubbing are almost always the same people who are placing the work for subtitling, who we're already working with. So actually, it's a, it's a very straightforward uh, cross-sell for us. To, to what extent is your solution unique and how much sort of you know, time advantage do you have on the competition? So the, um, in subtitling, there are some cloud software tools out there that uh, provide a capability so that you can actually do the, the job of subtitling itself in a, in a browser window. Um, our subtitling solution is essentially an end-to-end -end production pipeline capability. So, so that, that, that capability that exists in some other third-party systems that I mentioned is just one component of our bigger ecosystem. So essentially what our systems will do will, will be to automatically manage, the, you know, project manage these, these projects as they come in, as they, the orders are placed by clients into the systems they will automatic, automatically progress those through all the way to completion, thereby um, you know, dramatically reducing the uh, kind of human time that would normally be spent in other competing businesses to actually manage those as they go through. In terms of the, your coverage of the content providers, mm -hmm. is that a global coverage you have? You have lots of salespeople going to certain areas where the content is more prolific? Right. So we have, uh, so our commercial team is, uh, sale, the sales biz dev team is about seven people currently, two of them in the UK, the rest are in the US. About 90% of our revenue is actually generated out of the US. So, the, so many of the big buyers we've focused on so far have been US based. Um, we have uh, obviously a growing customer base now um, in the UK uh, and, and Europe. Um, so, so the, essentially, the, the, the clients that are particularly interesting to us are those who will commission localization across many languages. Um, and they tend to be, uh, and the bulk of the work that we do is actually for original English material that's going from English into other languages. That said, we do do some work that where the original language may be something else, and then we, we're translating it into English as well as other languages too. So I was thinking that, for instance, you know, India has a great sort of this Hollywood industry. Yeah. Are you covering those as content providers? So we have, so we have, our, we have affiliates in India. So typically they would be pursuing um, local content producers in that territory and fulfilling their orders using our systems. And, we, and in that case, we will be receiving um, an income from that affiliate that uh, is related to that work. As on dubbing, which seems to me like the big opportunity, <clears throat> are you having to be cheaper than the current competition or is the speed of execution enough for them to change? If you're going to make a you know, serious inroad into that, yeah. into that $1.4 billion. Okay, our expectation is that we will offer, uh, we, you know, we, we're completely transparent with our clients, uh, which is another thing that differentiates us from our competitors. And we make it very clear to them how we're going about doing this. And obviously, we need them to be comfortable about the approach that we're taking. So they understand that we have, uh, that we will almost certainly have, uh, in some cases, quite significantly lower operational costs of actually fulfilling that work than the traditional approach. And so they will reasonably expect us to share with them some of those, uh, those benefits. So our working assumption is that we will price 
the projects are, are kind of below um, uh, below the kind of prevailing market rates for those services, yet still be able to offer um, uh, to you know equivalent or better quality turn those projects around more quickly. I mean, how much below are we talking? Uh, it's a it's a function of um, yeah, I'd say double digit percentage points. Could, could you explain a bit, a bit to me a bit more? I'm not sure I understand how widespread you are yet because uh, you've been able to give us figures for EMEA. You say you can't give us figures for the US, okay? You can't give us figures for Asia, and, and particularly for Asia. How much business have you been doing in Asia, and how do you do it? Uh, you said you have an affiliate in India. Um, what about the rest of Asia? Okay, so uh, so just be just to make sure I'm I'm really clear about this. Um, there, I think there are two things here. One is who pays the bills. Mm -hmm. And the other is the languages into which that, that, uh, yeah, that works so the, the bills are presumably, because you're doing it in English at the moment, largely in English, they're largely coming from American studios. Yeah. Um, but I, I really want to know more about how much they're actually getting you to do in Asia, or in Asian languages. Um, it, they are a standard part of the, you know, we, we offer these services into 50 plus languages. So you have lots of actors in Asia as well. So at the moment, so we have translators in those countries. We are at a much earlier stage with dubbing. So we are just in the process of essentially building out that network of voice actors. And, and our focus in the early stages will be on nine languages, which are the most popular um, uh, uh, chosen ones. Are any of those Asian? Are they all European? Or not? They're actually, I don't think any of them is, um, is an Asian language at the moment. But whether, whether it's appropriate or not to commission a dubbed soundtrack in a country is, as much as anything, a function of the cultural and market expectations in that territory. So, for example, France and Italy are known as dubbing territories because there actually is legislation that requires broadcasters, for example, in those countries to have uh, local language spoken on the content. So if they're licensing English original materials, they will have to dub it. Whereas other countries, for example, like the Scandi countries, uh, are referred to as subtitling territories because the preference of consumers in those territories is for subtitles. Uh, and have you formed any idea as to whether or not the Asian countries are subtitle countries or dubbing countries, because as, as has been said, obviously dubbing is your growth area. They, both areas are growth areas. So we're doubling, uh, period by period, we're doubling our, our subtitling business. And, we, and, and obviously we're not going to be able to indefinitely continue on an exponential growth curve, but, but we are uh, able to grow that considerably. If we did nothing other than subtitling, and in fact did nothing other than subtitling with our existing clients, we could grow that uh, for, for several years, we believe. I think dubbing is, yes, is just a whole new substantial opportunity given the size of the, you know, the billable amounts for a project there compared with, uh, with subtitling. And where do you expect your dubbing future to be for the next few years? My expectation is that we will build out this, um, our network, international network. So we'll get, you know, a year from now, we'll have um, voice actors in all of the countries into which um, we're having dubs um, commissioned. We'll have, um, you know, we'll be able to do proper casting. So when a cl client is, is, um, is choosing a voice actor for a particular part, there is a choice of different voice actors to fill that part and they can choose between them. Um, and that will give us a capability such that then we can scale up considerably that doing um, opportunity. You're a software um, developer, if I've understood. Do you have anybody within the organization who's coming from an account management background and that very commercial piece? Um, and how, how's that? Part of the business. So the other, so the executive team, myself, Helen, and um, our commercial director, who is actually based in the U.S. and who has been responsible for basically establishing and growing that business, and and uh, primarily dealing with those you know, strategic. Uh, Can you tell us a bit about that person. So um, so Gordon is um, has got a background in the software industry. Um, he's been working with us for. Um, a long time. A long time. Um, more more he, than 10 years. He joined the board. Well, it says on there, 2000, 2008, I think he joined the board. Okay. But prior to that, I'd been working with us as our, uh, essentially as uh, the lead in our U US operation. Um, he comes from a kind of software um, industry uh, background. And he's been, as I say, um, key to us winning these major accounts in, um, in, in Hollywood and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.